I'm Indy Nidell, and once again, this is the Great War on the Road. Now today, I'm in Italy, and I'm at the Museum of Vittorio Veneto, which is dedicated to the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. Um, and here is the outside of the museum. Now, I'm going to go inside and look at some stuff, but first what I want to look at is what's on the first floor of the museum. You see, after the Battle of Cap Caporetto, when the front stabilized at the Piave River, the Central Powers occupied all of that Italian territory north of the Piave for a year until the Battle of Vittorio Veneto freed that part of Italy. Now, we're going to go in and first look at what happens during an occupation. Now, once you, your army has occupied a territory, there's certain basic steps you're going to have to take to get anything going. First of all, you're going to have to make an official proclamation of the occupation. What's prohibited? What's allowed to say that you are the new sheriff in town? You do, of course, have to communicate with the people whose land you're occupying. Now, if you see behind me, you see all these newspapers and gazettes. They are in Italian, which of course was not the official language of Austria-Hungary, but they had to communicate with the local people. And if you see some of these here, you can see that a lot of it was really brightly colored, vivid imagery. And this was because a large part of, uh, of the region was still illiterate or, or, or read poorly if they did read. So you had to do all these pictures and you can see that these pictures are very much the glory of the Central Powers victories in order to tell people, this is, we're winning, so be cool, this is us. You see this plane here? Nobody ever saw this plane here, right? But it is shooting down a bunch of British planes. And these are all, obviously, September 1918, September 1918. Now, a lot of the people that were here are during the occupation were women, children, old men, and priests, because many of the young men fled south across the Piave to escape the occupying army of young men that had invaded them. So you got a bit of a refugee crisis further south in Italy. Now, this refugee crisis was further exacerbated because you have to feed all those people coming down there. But feeding the people in the north, well, that was actually the occupier's job, but they had a bigger priority. Their priority was feeding their own nations. Now, we saw, we did a whole special about the turnip winter, and we know that by the winter of 1916 and 1917, much of Germany and much of Austria-Hungary was hungry and starving. So now, you had this occupying force taken over a big chunk of northern Italy with a big chunk of farms. It wasn't just food supplies that were being requisitioned, though. Everything was being requisitioned. They took, they took the bells down from the churches to take the metal, to use the metal to make weapons and ammunition. So this was not an especially happy time for the people under occupation who had had a fair amount of food beforehand, but now found themselves hungry because the food was being taken away from them. So if you're upset with your occupiers, what do you do? You create a resistance. You create spirings. You create, uh, here, here's some, uh, here's some, uh, Tandura, and there's another book over there. These were people who were actually spies, and these are their, their, the works they left behind. Now this basket here, they would use carrier pigeons to communicate their intelligence back to whoever their handler uh, further south in Italy was. Now we saw one spy ring, actually, which we talked about in our regular episodes, the Neely spy ring um, in the Ottoman Empire in Palestine, broken up because a carrier pigeon flew wrong and was intercepted by the Ottoman Empire, and it led to the destruction of that ring. As far as I'm aware, that didn't happen here, but you can see what a dangerous game it is to play. You're behind enemy lines, you are a spy, you have to send your information to the unoccupied part of your country. Uh, another means of communication was they would use, put, hang blankets in their windows and by moving the blanket would signal to planes that were flying by, they would signal information. I don't know exactly what sort of signal system they use, but I think that's pretty ingenious because you wouldn't, you wouldn't guess that. Let's move into here and stuff. Because uh, I mentioned the languages and stuff. You see all of this. I mean, nobody, nobody had more languages than Austria-Hungary. Fifteen different versions of the national anthem, troops of all nations, of all sub-nations, in the same regiments and battalions sometimes with leaders who spoke languages that they didn't understand especially well. Now, Italian was one of those, but this was a, a many of the invaders didn't speak any Italian and couldn't see, even communicate with some of their own comrades. So you had a whole new set of problems for this specific invading army. Now, we're going to go upstairs where they actually have the, the part of the museum that's dedicated to the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. Now, we'll, of course, cover that in our regular episodes, but there's some really interesting stuff up there that we want to go over anyhow, just to show you. Come on. 
Okay, now after the Battle of Caporetto, the front stabilized here at the Piave River, right? Um, Caporetto is up there, so that's where the central powers were moving in from. Uh, the Italians, re the defenses were reorganized by Diaz south of the Piave River. Now this is Vittorio Veneto, and this is what the Battle of Vittorio Veneto was named after. Thing is, now von Bello, the, uh, the commander of the German 14th Army that spearheaded, that led the invasion, he was told by, by um, Ludendorff when he was given the men and the army to, to put together the invasion n to do the, limited, the most limited offensive he could and get, so he could get his men back by December so they'd be ready for German offensives on the Western Front in the spring of 1918. So von Bello took this very seriously and he did not want to be an occupying army even though his generals and colonels below him wanted to do, achieve total victory over the Italians. Be that as it may. Defenses organized at the Piave River, so here they stood. Um, now, for a year, this area was occupied. All of this part of northern Italy was occupied by the Central Powers until the Battle of Vittorio Veneto, which we'll cover in our regular episodes, freed the occupying force. Now, during that battle, there was no actual fighting at Vittorio Veneto. The fighting was all here and up towards Monte Grappa, and then there's the Trentino further up there. The reason the battle is named after Vittorio Veneto is very interesting, because Vittorio Veneto was a, combined from two villages in the 1860s, and it was named the Vittorio, it was named after the king, of course, but also Vittorio is victory, and you have your victorious final breakthrough and the final armistice with Austria-Hungary as their country and their army disintegrates and you take hundreds of thousands of prisoners it is a serious victory and what are you gonna name it after? You're gonna name it after Vittorio, Vittorio Veneto. So that's why the battle is called that. I think this map is fantastic actually and you can see how the way the Piave works, how it just winds around like that and the reason that this was the center of of the, uh, this was the headquarters of the Central Powers, even though it was quite far away from the actual front, was because these passes and valleys here could give you a direct line to send information to Berlin and to Vienna. So, very strategically important. Uh, oh, I want to show you something while I'm standing here. This is probably the most important thing you will ever see on this channel, The Great War, right? They're talking about the first phase of the battle. What does it say? The first phase did not go as planned. That sums up the entire Great War, everything we've talked about for the last few years, because the first phase of nothing went as planned. And in fact, the second phase, third phase, fourth phase, nothing ever went as planned. The closest I can think went as planned was maybe Operation Albion, but even that, you know, this is the Great War. This is modern war, nothing goes as planned. So that made me very happy to read that, because it summed up the entire war in one single sentence, all right? Now this room is possibly the coolest room in the whole thing, although I did like that map. This is a room full of photographs, writings, documents from all the major players of this whole period. Like we have here our old pal, Cavilia, who we've talked about endlessly. Interesting that he's here, you know, because these are, these are the heroes, but Cavilia, of course, part of the blame for Caporetto can actually be laid at his feet because he was ordered to maintain a defensive stance, and he didn't. He set his men up for further offensives because he did not believe that central powers were going to attack. So his guys were set up for offense, not defense, when the crushing blow came. Hello, Cavilia. Nice to see you. Um, who else? Oh, there's, a, okay, Denuncio Gabriel. We talked about him in the Italy special, and he will be notorious after the war, but that's after the war, so you can definitely look him up yourself and see all kinds of stuff that he did in the early 20s. Uh, here is Lord Cavan. He was in charge of the British troops at uh, Vittorio Veneto, which is interesting because it wasn't just an Italian operation. This was a combined operation in contrast to most of the battles on the Italian front. There were 51 Italian divisions fighting. There were uh, British divisions, French divisions, an American division. There was the Czech legions were fighting. The Romanian legion was fighting. A real combined military operation. And I want to take you guys into this room because I want you to see something here. Okay, this is my new colleague, Angelo. Angelo, oh. say hello. Hi, Hindi. Welcome. Okay, and now Angelo is going to translate this proclamation for me because uh, it's cool and I want you guys to hear this, okay? Yeah. Just, okay. We now know that Italian soldiers on the Piave have heard on, in the night women screaming on the other side of the river. They well know what's happening on the other side. They heard from prisoners 
stories, horrific stories, citizens, slaughters, cows and horses taken away, everything taken away. The furniture are used to make fires and everywhere the Bosniak uh, troops were only traces of atrocities now stand. That's Austria, that's Germany, and that's your satellites, Bulgaria and Turk. And that is propaganda at its best, because this is November 1917, just a couple weeks after Caporetto. So now the Italians themselves were talking about the horrible, horrible things that these evil Central Powers people were doing. Thank you very much for that, Angela. It's nice to have you here. Um, now, you guys should definitely visit this museum if you're ever in the neighborhood because we've only seen a little bit of it and especially like the room with the photos and stuff. It's amazing. It's, and uh, the exhibitions are really cool. There's an entire uh, arsenal so you can see uh, weapons from not just the, the Italians, from the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, it's all the weapons that the guy that founded the museum actually collected. Now I'm going to end with something that I think some of you are going to like. Okay. Now. We did a special, a bio special, on Luigi Cadorna, the uh, chief of staff of the Italian army, until after Caporetto when he lost his job. And if you want to see that, you can click right here. But don't do it just yet, because if you walk back, there's a very nice picture of, ladies and gentlemen, our old pal, Generalissimo Luigi Cadorna. See you next time.